Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Terra CRG, The Wickoff Group, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Genova Burns. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, AmTrust Title, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Layumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Connect One Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, Flushing Bank, Friedman, LLP, Hendler Real Estate Organization, Hersha Hospitality, HAP, Investment Developers, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, iFunding, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Pulsinelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Meringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. There's a lot of questions of what's happening in healthcare. So today on the 16th anniversary of the Stoller Report, I am going to have people discuss the emerging trends in healthcare. My guests include Dr. Andy Racine, who is the Senior Vice President, Chief Medical Officer at the Montefiore Medical Center. Tony Ferrari, who is the Executive Vice President at Northwell Health. Dr. Arthur Klein, who is the President of the Mount Sinai Health Network. And last but not least, Dr. Gary Kalkud, who is the Senior Vice President in Charge of Network Integration at the MYU Langone Medical Center. So since most of the people have been in, in the business over the years, what's, what's happening? I mean, you see urgent care centers, you see signs, you, you, you see affiliations, you know, there were doctors who used to be in private practice. What's going on? How do you see it? You're, you're probably the new kid on the block with regard to mergers and acquisitions over the year. Uh, Tony, he's been acquiring. Andy's been acquiring. What's going on with the MYU Langone? I mean, now you're talking about Winthrop, you have Lutheran, you have other centers. There's, there's consolidation throughout uh, the healthcare system. NYU is somewhat distinct in that our consolidation and growth, the growth of our network, has largely been through physicians. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, we had 300 employed physicians. We now have 1,800 employed physicians throughout uh, the region in seven counties. Certainly with Lutheran and in discussions with Winthrop, we believe those communities and the physicians in those communities need strong hospitals to admit the patients when they need to be admitted. But we are an ambulatory system, and uh, there's excellence in the hospitals, but the same is true throughout this network that we have built uh, with ambulatory practice. But, the belief so, is so, but you've grown internally, okay? You take a, a Northwell, uh, who, and also uh, all three of you over here, you've, you've grown by mergers. Now, there was a PwC report recently saying that not at all mergers work. They don't work financially. Every different, you know, the, the different uh, possibilities that take care of it. How do you see mergers? How, how important are mergers, and how do you make a successful merger? So... You know, I've lived through several mergers, as you know, the New York uh, Hospital and Presbyterian merger, 
uh, the merger of hospitals in Rhode Island. But I, I had the if privilege you remember, of working for Northwell. Those mergers initially, the mergers that took place in the late 90s, were total failures for most of the systems because they weren't able to integrate properly. That's correct. So I think the first thing to make a merger successful is you have to understand the strategy that's driving the merger. Are you looking for market share? Are you looking for an insurance strategy or a population management strategy? Are you looking for geographic spread? So you have to be clear to your management and your board. Number two, you have to be very sensitive to the fact that mergers are not just mergers of institutions, they're mergers of cultures. And many of the failed mergers that have occurred, have occur the failures have occurred because there hasn't been a good recognition of the difference in cultures. And as, as physician executives, some of us around this table, we know that physicians do function well within certain cultures and resent the imposition of other cultures. And finally, and I've learned this in each system where I've experienced a merger, um, you have to spend money to make money. Uh, you have to accept that there's going to be a tremendous amount of cost and turbulence if you're going to make the merger work. You've got to acclimate your staff to it. You've got to acclimate your board to it. And you have to make sure you have the resources so that you're not bankrupting other important strategies at the same time. And there's sometimes a, a lack of recognition of just how much resource and energy it's going to take to make a merger work. In reality, sitting around here, the, the team who's really made the most mergers, I'd say, over the last couple of years would be Northwell. Uh, Northwell's been very active and has been involved in affiliations and mergers uh, for many years now, uh, starting in the late 80s. For my viewers, people always hear the word affiliation and ownership. What's the difference? Uh, owner ownership really is a full merger of the organizations, bringing them together, uh, joining the boards, ultimately, as in the case recently of Northwell, reducing the size of the board from what was somewhere in the area of 130 members to 30. And just a matter of a couple of months where we've been able to do that, it makes it a more workable board at this point. It's a fiduciary board as opposed to the local advisory boards at the hospitals. The affiliation really is, is a term that's used when there's some kind of an alliance between the organizations where there's no ownership involved. Uh, there's no sharing of liabilities or assets. Uh, affiliations are important for institutions that really have a, a, a joint interest in doing things together. And it may be data, it may be analytics, it may be other things that actually bring them together where they can help each other out, where they might not individually have the resources to accomplish what they want to accomplish, but as part of an affiliation, they're able to do some things that they wouldn't normally be able to do. Andy, on your situation, are you, most of yours, acquisitions or affiliations? Uh, it's, we're doing both. I think to get back to the real center of gravity of what this is about, and this gets to some of the things that Arthur was saying, you really have to decide what it is strategically that the institution is designed to accomplish. And from our standpoint, we've talked about this on this program and elsewhere, the issue about population-centered management is really what Montefiore is trying to, to do. And so then you have to decide, well, what is it that is the needs of the population that you're serving? And what geographic area are you going to be responsible for? And what do you have to provide in order for the patients in that area to stay well and to be healthy? And so that can be, then once you have that strategy set, there are a whole bunch of tactical decisions you can exactly. make about how to accomplish that. W we? With regard to that, one of the topics that people read in the papers or hear is ACO. Mm -hmm. Montefiore has been leader in this area because of the population and the demographics. Would you explain to my viewers what ACO and how, how profitable it can be to, an inst to a healthcare institution? Well, again, this is not so much an issue of how profitable it can be to the institution. The, an ACO or how much you is don't a, lose. <laughs> an ACO is a financial arrangement between the federal government and a provider institution that was designed through the Affordable Care Act to incentivize providers to essentially take care of patients on a cost trajectory that will allow that care to be taken care of at a certain quality standard without increasing costs more than some reference population. So the way it works is the federal government comes to you and says, here are a bunch of people that are Medicare, Medicare fee-for-service patients for which you are going to be responsible. We're going to give you, uh, we're going to estimate how much you're spending to take care of them in a base year, and we're going to follow that over time. And if the change in the cost for those patients in your 
program is less than some national reference standard, we will split with you the savings that occur between the reference standard and yours. Now, and so the incentive for you is to make sure, A, that you accomplish this with certain quality metrics, because if the quality metrics aren't met, you don't have any opportunity to share in any savings, and B, to manage those patients in such a way that the cost trajectory is modified. Mm -hmm. Michael, I agree with Andy completely. I would say something else. For many of our systems, it isn't just the profitability, if there is some from the ACO. It's the experience we're gaining in learning how to manage populations so that we can, in essence, deal with the tremendous cost and burden of healthcare in this country. What we want to do is take away the burden of a lot of expense for low acuity healthcare when it can be delivered more efficiently and more cost effectively and be able to continue to invest in what's made American healthcare great, which is technology research, innovation. Right. And the bottom, and, I'm sorry, go ahead, Gary. Well, and, and, and there's a spectrum uh, of, of assuming risk. There's sharing uh, of savings with the government. Uh, that's part of the ACO model. And then there's uh, complete global capitation where the provider is fully responsible for the, finance, the finances and the, exactly. the clinical part. And I think that spectrum is Everyone is in some part of that spectrum mm -hmm. right now, and that's going to evolve. In a the way risk is, is a key, though, because it, it, the incentives then align with providers. But, but, uh, it, but in essence, if, if you, what we're saying is if we keep the patient healthy, we're going to be able to, to cut the risk. Okay, if, if you're doing proper screening and you're doing additional testing, that you, you, you don't have that, that major medical expense coming in later on, you know, for a condition that could have been saved, you know, if, if they did an endoscopy and they found out that there was, you know, colon cancer or something else. Mike, that's only part of it. So we certainly want to keep patients healthy, but we also want to make sure that our sickest patients get to the level of care they need expeditiously so they don't get sicker, mm -hmm. and that their aftercare is rendered in the most effective way. And that's a big piece of it as well. And I think what we've all learned in this quote unquote risk environment is that as healthcare providers, we face an, a daunting amount of social issues that aren't even medical. Can I, do I have transportation to get to the doctor? Can, am I, uh, do I understand what the doctor has said to me? Mm -hmm. Can here's I get the, to the pharmacy? Here's the bottom line about this. Health, health status is a function of a whole bunch of things. Education, housing, nutrition, exactly. safety, air quality. And then a small amount of it, a small amount of it, is healthcare services. Right. We in the United States conventionally underinvest in all those first things education, nutrition, safety, air quality, safety, all those things. We underinvest in that. And then we end up with populations of folks who have a distribution of illness that is larger than it otherwise would be had we done those investments. Mm -hmm. And what do we do? We turn to the Garys and the Arthurs and Tonys and myself, and we say to them, there are all these sick people out there. You're responsible for taking care of them. You have to make these people well or keep them well. As a consequence of which, all of our institutions are going around saying, well, we're going to have to now invest in all these other things that we know actually are driving health care status, health status. It's not so much what's going on in the hospital. It's everything else. Sure. It's and housing and transportation and education and, and all these things that we are now sitting there saying, well, how are we going to address this issue? Because that's really what's going to change the health status of the patients that we're looking after. And those are reflected in healthcare costs. All of these issues that we are trying to solve uh, as you move into risk. What Arthur said, I think, is a key, sort of the first law of population health management. 1% uh, of the patients spend 20% of the healthcare dollars. 5% spend 50%. Exactly. If you don't, if you want to take cost out of the system and improve care, you have to do much better with those patients. And it's a mix largely dominated by chronic illness. There's catastrophic illness in there also, but you have to be better at that. When we, when we look at the healthcare system in the region, we're, we're looking at the people in the region, but when I hear from Arthur and everyone, and I do research, we see that Arthur is in Jupiter, you're in Boca, you're, you're in different markets, then you have all of these um, foreigners who come to your hospitals for treatment. They're not part of, you know, they're not in the geographical market. Why do you 
build these affiliations in Florida, in, uh, in uh, Kazakhstan, or, you know, other markets in the world? So the answers are as multivariant as the, <laughs> as the opportunities. The Florida market, I think, Tony and I would agree, is unique because there is a tremendous movement of people up and down the East Coast corridor in this country. And if you're going to manage the Medicare population, if you're going to make sure cancer patients continue to get the therapy they need when they move from one location to another, if you're going to manage even the social issues of, of an aging and frail population, there is an, a strategic reason to be in Florida. Uh, let's also be honest. Our institutions require a tremendous amount of capital support to keep them where they are in the firmament of world-class medical institutions. And increasingly, while we see reimbursement uh, uh, challenges, we look for other opportunities that present us with, with uh, financial support. Some of them obviously come from consultancies and arrangements we make around the world or around the country. Some of them come from the disproportionate financial impact of international medical tourism. And that's a game not only Americans play, it's a game now played all over the world. Some of it comes, and let's be very honest about it, from the phenomenal impact of philanthropy, particularly on healthcare development in this part of the country. We've, all of us around this table have been the, the around this room have been the beneficiaries of that. So it is really a complex question that you've asked, Mike. To, to Arthur's point, uh, and, and in our case at Northwell, with our relationship with Boca Raton Regional Medical Center, uh, we follow the patient. Uh, and, and Arthur said it very eloquently, that uh, what, what we do is that there's a need to provide a service, and we follow the patient to wherever the patient goes. We share medical records, health records, between Boca Raton Regional and the Northwell Health System to make certain that when one of our patients is in Boca Raton, is in Florida, they have an opportunity to have their record shared. And there's a concierge service where there's a, a, a nurse practitioner at Boca who follows the patients when they come down from the northeast down to the southeast. So, so our expansion uh, has been driven by where our patients live. Mm -hmm. And uh, our interest in Florida is the same thing. There, there are many patients. Are you who in go Florida down now? We have discussions going on in Florida right now. Mm -hmm. but. It, we're in Suffolk County and Nassau County and Upper Westchester. That's where our patients live and are referred into. Their families are there. That's driven the expansion. I, I, I hear Suffolk County. I can understand Montefiore, uh, Westchester. I can understand Nassau and Suffolk County over here. But then I hear National Jewish Hospital in Denver, and I hear Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I say, that's out of the region. So... I, I can answer that probably since both of those are Mount Sinai initiatives. In the case of National Jewish, it was a recognition that they had a reputational status, a clinical status, and an academic status, which could rapidly enhance our pulmonary service to the benefit of our patients and to the benefit of the communities we serve. And that's what that relationship is all about. And for Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, it was, again, a very strategic decision that the footprint of pediatric services at Mount Sinai clinically was small and not of the reputational status of Children's Hospital Yet, of Philadelphia. Yet, in the city of New York, we do have a month, if you're, has a wonderful Children's Hospital. New York Presby uh, has a, uh, an excellent Children's Hospital. We're building, well, you're a building a children's You're building a children's hospital. You know, with Don't state Northwell, Cones, have, have, Northwell Cone, has Cone's children's, children's Hospital that goes back to Arthur over there. Mm -hmm. So we have these other facilities. Now, in, in the same manner is when we do these mergers or affiliations, we have duplication of, you know, certain specialties. Like we have a number, we were talking about a number of cancer centers that we have. You know, and the question is... Um, out of nowhere, uh, MD Anderson, who's been advertising, you know, they, they took out the word, we're no longer cancer. I mean, their, their marketing approach, which you came out with a new pro approach in May also on marketing uh, over there. Uh, MD Anderson out of Texas is now going into with the Summit Medical Group in New Jersey. Okay, you know, so they're coming over here. So there's, you know, you're, you know the, the territorial markets over there are, are changing also. Five years ago, eight years ago, Hopkins was advertising it in the New York Times on page one for Johns Hopkins. 
I think a lot of that, MD Anderson, national reputations, CHOP, are looking to expand their market. Right. And the New York market is, although certainly crowded, has 15 million people, and depending on where you draw the geography, 25 million people, it is uh, an irresistible target in some ways. So, Mike, it would be hard to go anywhere in the world and find the competitiveness that exists in the New York market. On the one hand, it's an advantage because we get the best and the brightest because we're competitive and it keeps us on our toes and it makes us be innovators and it makes us make sure our population's well served. On the other hand, for those very reasons, we, we, we have to depend on being basically as complete in the service array as we possibly can as individual systems. And that's just a very big part of the uniqueness of the New York market. And, and in the specialty market, you know, if you talk about this way, New York is the home of, uh, you know, Memorial Sloan, who has growing themselves. They're in Westchester, and they're in New Jersey. They're opening the Pennsylvania market over there in the situation. And then recently, right now, I understand, I think it's Jefferson and, uh, no, University of Pennsylvania and Princeton Medical Center are planning a merger. So, That's correct. And, so. and uh, 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 Dana Farber is coming into Stanford, Connecticut. What's happening with this telemedicine? Okay, five years ago, nobody heard about telemedicine. And there's, a, there's talking about the Uberization of healthcare. <laughs> um, I think a lot of us in healthcare were caught by surprise by the phenomenon of urgent care, and which I would call immediate care or convenient care, and how that swept over the market very, very rapidly. And I think all of us learned from the urgent care experience that we are dealing with really significant generational issues about how our populations want to seek health care. They want convenience, they want immediacy. And, and, they, and, they, and they want us to think out of the box in the ways that we provide that health care. And one of those real issues for us now is providing telemedicine, uh, basically remote access to health care services. Tell a 65-year-old patient who remembers the old health care system that I opened up that you are now going to go on a camera on your iPhone and you're going to see Dr. Racine Okay, on the telemedicine, okay? And or maybe not even see Dr. Racine, you may be seeing the nurse practitioner who's going to make an evaluation over there. But how do you also tell that same person that when they call their inter internist for an appointment, that their appointment is three months from now? Uh, the success of urgent care centers is really has a lot to do with how healthcare has changed so dramatically to the point that we used to have house calls or you would call your doctor, I have a cold, come in and see me in, uh, this afternoon or tomorrow. Now you call and have a cold, I'll see you in three months. Right. The cold will be long gone by then. And so I think it's the convenience, as Arthur said, convenient care that has drawn people, as you will see with telemedicine, it's the convenience of telemedicine. And, and it's not for everyone. Right. It may not be for a 65 year old, although there are lots, the convenience and access is, is critically important for many people. And if you look at urgent care use, a lot of it is for younger people, mm -hmm. but it's, it's quick, it's uh, convenient, I mean, and it works. Urgent care, uh, do you have an affiliation with urgent care centers or your own? We have our own urgent care centers that are essentially um, in the same geography, in the same geographic location as our large ambulatory primary care network. But you're doing it in your network area. I mean, uh, Go Health mm -hmm. has probably opened up about 32 centers, okay? And Go Health is affiliated, I think, with Unum in a way and also with you, okay? Uh, Go Health is jointly owned by Access Health and Northwell with Northwell owning a majority interest in the sites uh, and with um, Access Health owning a majority interest in the MSS. Now, at, do the doctors work for Northwell? Do they work for Go Health? They work for Arthur, Go Health. You, you have a couple of... Er and we have, a, we have a, a good partnership with CityMD and with several other... Uh, er what do you mean by a partnership with CityMD? We, we agree to work together for the benefit of the patient which means if the patient needs additional levels of care, we're happy to expedite that. Uh, we talk about strategy. We talk about how, um, how there are certain practices that would benefit by knowing that urgent care is available in their community when, they're, when it's after hours. You're, you're asking about uh, um, a snapshot in time of a rapidly evolving system. Exactly. 
uh, this gets back to a lot of the discussion that's taken place here. This, you're, what you're witnessing is a large sector of U.S. industry trying to adapt to a change in demand. And that change in demand has more to do with things that were already mentioned, people wanting to be seen more quickly, not wanting to have maybe as much um, involvement as they would in a primary care full service visit, and wanting to do that at their own time. Now wait, let me just finish. And so how has this industry responded to it? Through Urgent Care, through affiliations with CVS and Walgreens, through telehealth. But where we are now, today, in August 2016, is not where we're going to be in November, let alone next August. Mm -hmm. And the, the question that all of us around here have to answer is, how much are you going to spend in terms of in, investing in brick and mortar urgent care centers that you're going to end up owning? And how much are you going to say, well, I don't know exactly where this is going, so I'm going to do a little bit of an agreement here, and I'm going to do a little bit of something here, and I'm going to wait and see where it is that the consumer is going to demand. And telehealth it. expands your network without the bricks in mortar. Correct. And I think it's driven by its, its patient experience. It's the technology that's available that makes things uh, the one-day hips, as you talked about. We've done 150 same-day hip surgeries with excellent results. The patients are extremely satisfied with that. And, and then there's cost. Right. And we all understand that cost needs to come out of that. Situation. And Mike, I think what Andy said is very critical in this regard, in all regards, but we want to be as horizontally and vertically complete as we can as systems. We don't have the capital or the bandwidth in management or the resources to be that in the current world. So we have to create partnerships. And uh, then we I'm have to basically evaluate what, what works and what but, doesn't. I, I'm, I'm very familiar with the world of private equity. And when an entity is owned by a private equity company, a private equity company has a life to the deal. So it could be five years, it could be seven years, it could be 10 years. When you're in joint venture with a for-profit and you are a non-profit, okay, there's a bif different culture and different philosophy uh, that, that one has to remember that can happen. A lot Look, of us I, lose sleep I believe, over it. Okay, I yeah. believe that the urgent care centers have a definite need, and the urgent care center today is not the urgent care center that was originally part of Continuum on the, the old Beth Israel. It's right. a totally different world uh, because it is, you see a doctor more quicker, it's less expensive than going to the emergency room, you have a less out of pocket, so there, there are benefits to the urgent care. But I also don't see how on a couple of block radio radius, it's like Starbucks, you can have six urgent care centers on 2nd Avenue or, you know, with, within the, you know, in the NYU area and they're not affiliated with you, they may, they may be about 15 urgent care centers over there. They're throughout, throughout the city. Right. And, and uh, again, I think they're meeting a need that patients are not getting largely more out of the offices, PCP offices, I'll, I'll see you in a week when you have a sore throat and you're going away on a trip, you want to get seen today. Mm -hmm. we, that responsiveness has not happened. It's less coming out of the ER, at least in our experience, but the PCPs exactly. are not seeing these patients. Right. We're going to have to continue for next week because we have so much more to discuss. So I'd like to thank Andy, Tony, Arthur, and Gary, and I'll see you next week.